what's the difference between that being fully aware, equanimous, let's use a you know, spiritual term, than say numbing? Because one may say, like, I'm just trying to numb all this pain and emotions out such that I can be quote unquote clear. What is the distinction between the two when you're in that state? If you don't have the training over time, it's not a choice to be numb. Ah. You just don't have the ability to, you're just in overwhelm. Got it. <clears throat> you're just stuck in overwhelm. So you don't have the ability, you don't have the skill to make clear decisions in that moment. Mm. When you're in the struggle, when you're overwhelmed, when you're stuck, when you're literally in a situation where you can't get out mm. in that moment because another person is putting force on you, mm. right? You can't get out until just the right moment when you find the space, when you find the right mm. movement. Mm. So it's knowing when to be calm and when to explode, mm. when the space is there, when, when to be patient and when to go. Mm. This episode is brought to you by C.K. Lynn Mindset Coaching for Leaders, Entrepreneurs, and High Achievers. Having a clear mind will empower you to tap into your true potential and achieve extraordinary results with more ease and freedom. If you're ready for and committed to a full transformation, visit www.talkwithck.com and apply for a free clarity session today. Man, that's beautiful. What's beautiful? Hot babe. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, to me, it's a has a beautiful grounding effect. And as I was speaking to you before we started recording, uh, meditation and all these processes and practices are beautiful, and a lot of them require a effort to concentrate or effort to visualize something or. You know, experience something. Whereas Hape is totally passive. You administer this, and Hape just grounds you immediately. Which I think, as we've talked about so much, the <clears throat> there's so much talk about balance, right? Everything mm -hmm. returning to balance. Everything's an effort return to balance. <clears throat> we um, we integrate polarities to experience that balance, and even more importantly, integration and awakening. And to have a balance in our lives of those processes, those practices that require effort so we cultivate that strength within us, but then bringing in these tools from nature that are passive that allow us to tap in and, and feed us with that energy of nature. It's good to do both. Mm. So one thing I wanted to say is I'm really excited to have my friend Andrew here with me today on this show. Thank you so much for being on the show, by the way. And thank you for being here. Yeah. Or thank you for having me yeah. on it. Such an honor, such an honor to get to know you. Yeah. What were you before? How did you feel then? And how did Jiu-Jitsu and the, the study of spirituality shift your life? Um. So from 13 to 21, I drank enough for a lifetime. Mm. Like my whole teenage years is just like a lot of substance abuse, a lot of anger, depression, feeling like shit about myself, um, constant thoughts of not wanting to be alive. Mm. Um, just a lot of inner demons, mm. a lot of intensity that way. And a lot of immaturity. I didn't have good examples of men in my life to show me how to really be and to be intimately be there with me in my life and show mm. me how I could, how I can be in a healthy way. Mm. Um, and it, I hated school. I hated going to church and these are all these things that I had to do. Mm. Right. So once I got, once I got out of high school and I was 18, so I did, I, I had the choice to go to church or not. Once I stopped going to church and stopped going to school, I opened up intellectually and spiritually. Oh, interesting. So when it's, when it was forced upon you, I did nothing. You resisted it. I resisted. <clears throat> I see. When the when the force is taken away, when the restraint is taken away. Right when I became... graduated high school, I opened, I read so many books on spirituality. <laughs> I stopped going to church. I stopped going to school. I started reading tons of books, mm. and I started practicing jujitsu and studying meditation techniques and mm. spiritual healing techniques and really seeking it out eagerly. Mm. Um, and changed my diet, started reading about nutrition and mm. stopped eating fast food and, 
Mm. Um, I started feeling a real sense of happiness within myself, mm. a real sense of health, a real sense of direction and um, started and that inevitably brought healthier people into my life. Mm. All of a sudden I'm seeking these things out. So I'm going to retreats. I'm being a part of different communities. Now all of a sudden I've got great examples of healthy, happy people around me. Right. So, um, you know, now I feel, now I feel that before up until I was about 20 years old, I felt like I was getting, I was really getting older all the time in the way that like my body was feeling more run down. I was feeling more weighed down by life. Now I'm 32, 32 tomorrow. And I feel like I'm getting younger every day. Mm. I really, f I feel like I'm getting younger and healthier every day. Like I haven't even reached my prime, not even close. Mm. And yet I try to live like I am in my prime all the time. Mm. So from feeling worse and older every day to feeling younger, healthier, happier with mm. every day, mm. feeling better with every day, mm. feeling closer to God with every day in a way that feels free to me for myself, for my personal relationship with God, not the way someone else tells me it is. Right. So mm. I often say to people, loving God is not just for religion. Mm. And say more about that. What do you mean by that? Well, there's so much attitude within religion that you need to have religion in order to love God. And, or, mm. you know, the only times you ever hear people say, like, talk about loving God is like in church. Mm. You know, it's kind of like they've like taken that some certain terminologies and kept said, you have to be in this club in order to love God. You have to, you have to read the Bible in order to love God. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that aren't in re aren't religious see the terms of like loving God. There's kind of a trigger around that. That's like a Christian thing or that's like, you know, a very religious thing. But, um, I think about that as the most important thing in my life to mm. remember to do, mm. to give love to the source of love. Mm. And that is where, um, that's the only way I think to truly experience Mm. the deepest love and um, I do that and that's going to look a little bit different for everyone but to love God and the language can be different for other people but for me to love God is the most natural thing I can do there's no medium necessary there's no religion necessary for that right you don't need to intermediary for that to love the source of my creation that mm -hmm. allows me mm -hmm. the source of all that is and ever will be mm -hmm. the source of every aspect of my existence mm -hmm. to give love back to that mm -hmm. is, um, is, un is happening underlyingly in every moment. Mm -hmm. And that's what my spiritual seeking has taught me. And prior to, my own spiritual practice, my own practices and really having my practices in life since I was 18, I had no sense of that. Mm. Just lost and angry. Mm. And I only felt fulfillment when I was drunk. Mm. Actual fulfillment or the illusion of fulfillment? The illusion. Mm. My In the moment, it felt like it. Mm. In the moment, I felt like oh, this is when I feel the best. Mm. This is when I feel alive, mm. happy, mm. distracted. Mm. And that's what I want to support other eager individuals. Mm. It's easy to say, you know, it can be easy to get into. That's what I want to support everyone with. Mm -hmm. But that's not true because it's only possible through each person's individual eagerness to experience that. Say more about that. What do you mean by that? If someone wants to change their lives for the better, they have to, the drive has to come from within them mm. first and foremost. Right. So all people that are eager, I want to be there to support them. There has to be an inspired healer, coach, counselor, supporter 
mentor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has to be the inspired facilitator and the eager practitioner, the eager client. Mm -hmm. You need those two f for the recipe to work. Yeah, there's a phrase I heard recently, you can't force readiness. Yeah. Yeah, really. When the student's ready, the teacher shows up. I think as a teacher, as a coach, as a consultant, in my younger days, I ignore that. I just impose my solutions on other people who weren't ready, who weren't seeking. And then naturally their resistance, uh, their reaction is resistance and repulsion. So, yeah. and, and, then, and then I would judge them for not being ready and all these other things. And then what I realized, like, everyone is not the perfect spot. Yeah. If they're seeking and they're ready, they're going to seek you out. If you're not, they're not. They're, they are perfect just wherever they are. Right. It's just what it is. You know, I noticed that for myself, I looked back and as I've worked with a handful of clients that weren't, didn't really have that eagerness or drive, like someone else told them they should do it. So they're like, all right, I'll try it. And I just, we just end up spinning in circles. We don't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. But the people that come in that are eager, it's like I barely have to do anything and they pop. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, fuck, I changed my life solely through eagerness that was born out of myself mm -hmm. and then sought out. I didn't get support first. The eagerness was born and then I sought out the support mm -hmm. and I got tons of it. Mm -hmm. It's still like bountiful in ways that I'm just feel so blessed and humbled by. Mm -hmm. So one thing specifically that caused me for it to have you on the show in a public way is that you are a dedication, you're a dedicated student of life, a transformational artistry. You are a, a second degree, you're about to get your second degree black belt in Jiu Jitsu, which Correct. as people who are not, who are, who are listening to this is a arduous, it's a very long journey. <clears throat> it requires a certain amount of dedication to be able to climb the ladder of Jiu Jitsu. Correct. And you're also a student of um, internal work, transformational work. You're in training to be a, 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 a master coach for a warrior sage. So right away, you know, to me, the, it calls for a, a external and internal balance. I call it the inner game and the outer game. You're a student of both. Oftentimes, I see people who are just focused on the outer game the body or business, whatever it may be, the external, or some people just totally focus on the internal, the, um, <clears throat> the spirituality, the meditation, the study, the ashrams, the meditation in the cave, all these things. What I'm looking for when I speak to uh, noble warriors whenever I have a chance is finding people who actually have a dedication to both. Because I believe that <clears throat> our body is these this, this vehicle that brings forth to us, if we truly want to maximize the potential that's within us, I believe one needs to do both. So I'm curious to know if you can speak a little bit about that. Why did you <clears throat> pick, why did you spend your precious life and energy and dedication to both? Well, as we talk about in, the, in kind of the language here in our training, that balance of spine and heart, mm. right? which you could translate to the cultivation of the inner and the outer strengths, the physical and the mental, emotional, spiritual. For me, it's all, it's all one thing. It's all necessary. I can't do one without the other, mm -hmm. because if I do one without the other, I feel out of balance. Mm -hmm. I feel, I don't feel stable. I don't feel as strong as I want to feel, right? I could, I could lift weights and train jujitsu all the time, but if I feel like shit inside myself, if I'm not living as my authentic self, if I have all these woundings from my childhood that are still nagging at me, it's eventually going to catch up to me. It's like, for me, it's a necessity. And, um, you know, I can't totally speak for everyone, but I believe that that is true for everyone. That's my belief, personally. We all need to have that balance of inner and outer strength. And whatever that looks like for us, it's going to be different practices are going to call to different people. Um, what's called to me is spiritual practice, sp 
which just means the development of understanding the truth of reality and the truth of who I am and uh, trying to be uh, the most conscious person that I can be in the world. Um, being in right relationship, which means relationship with nature, with the land that I live on, with the people in my lives, that's required to live a good life. And in order to live that good life, I have to do my inner work. I have to be as conscious as I possibly can be, or else, I, or else right relationship is not available to me. Right? And I'm an active man. I have this body that needs tending to. So I need to be active. I need to be strong. I'm fed by physical contact. Uh, I'm fed by lifting weights. You know, if I can, if I can pick 400 pounds up off the ground, that makes me feel really fucking good and strong and powerful. But I have to remember that that's not the only place that my power comes from. If I only focus on the physical, then I think, oh, I'm a big badass man who walk around. I can pick up, pick up 400 pounds off the ground. Well, Someone else, you'll get someone like Ishan or guys like Gary. They're, they're not, they're not big men. You know, they're physically, they're small men, but man, their presence is big, a lot bigger than a lot of big, strong dudes that I know. Mm. And I'd way rather walk in the battle, you know, in quotations, like the battle of life with them than I would someone who has done zero inner work but they're 250 pounds of muscle. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so in my mind, why the balance of the two, the, the internal and the external? Because to me, <clears throat> your, our physicality, our mentality, our emotionality, our spirituality, there are different fuels, fuel tanks. Yeah. <clears throat> or another way to kind of look at it, maybe, yeah, let's, let's use that metaphor fewer tanks. If, if one is totally empty, then you're totally lopsided. Yeah. You won't be able to truly live that maximum or most optimal lifestyle. Yeah. Because easily one could just take you out. Let's say if you easily pissed off because you carried some internal wound. Actually, I've been on jury duty at one point where people do stupid shit and just throw their life away because they have a violent reaction to something like yeah. so tiny. As an example, obviously. So yeah. if you're listening to this, probably you're not of that caliber, but, but as an illustration, that's, that's what I see. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so I'm curious, why did you pick specifically this practice with Warrior Sage or the practice of Jiu-Jitsu? Out of all things, infinite possibilities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've always been an athlete. I've always been, I did sports growing up a lot. And um, my senior year of high school, I was done playing football. Football was like, provided a lot of benefits for me. I played football for six years, but there's also a lot of toxic mentality in the culture of football. And um, man, I was 18 years old and my body was beat to shit. Mm. Like I felt like I was 60 between all the, you know, training my ass off and beating up my body and just beating up my back and my joints and everything and not taking the right care of my body. So I had constant, I'm 18 years old and I have chronic back pain. I'm stiff all the time. I'm eating an unhealthy diet. I'm drinking all the time. I was like really into drinking and using opiates and to, to mask my pain because that was the only time I felt good and could feel kind of like normal myself or yeah. normal mm. or happy. So, um, after football was done, I needed something else. So I found fighting, I found jujitsu. So I just translated that, the emotional and physical aggression to jujitsu mm. and to boxing. So you, you boxed? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I did box for a while. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And then I had a shoulder injury and then my body was just so beat up, I couldn't keep up the pace mm. that I wanted to keep up. Mm. But I still stuck with jiu-jitsu. I had shoulder surgery. I've had knee surgeries. Um, and it's been a journey for me to figure out how to actually be free from physical pain mm. and emotional pain. Mm. And I found that they both contributed to each other. Emotional pain from jiu-jitsu? 
from life. From life, okay, just just a little underlying. I want to clarify what you're saying. Yeah, emotional okay. pain from life. So mm -hmm. the physical pain was from playing football for years, mm -hmm. drinking, eating an unhealthy diet, mm -hmm. just being kind of toxic in my activity and, mm -hmm. and overdoing it. Mm -hmm. um, so, but what brought me to jujitsu was that I was just looking for another way to express myself through an art form, uh, through a sport, through fighting. I wanted to fight. Um, but then that kind of, as I realized how beat up my body was, I, need, I realized I needed to change. Mm. So I stuck with jujitsu because I love jujitsu. Mm -hmm. I love the art form of it. I love the physicality of it. Mm. Um, and then when I was 19, I started really exploring... 18, 19, I started exploring spirituality, mm. thought, what is this meditation thing about? I'm in martial arts now. I've seen the images of like martial artists meditating and mm. having that ability. And I realized I couldn't, I don't have the ability to even sit in a quiet room mm. for five minutes. Mm -hmm. That would drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. I need a TV on. I need mm -hmm. junk food to eat. I need to be drunk. I need to be this, this or that, you know, so, mm. um, so I started practicing meditation and over But why did you do that though? Because it sounded painful the way you describe it. Yeah. I couldn't do it for five minutes. I needed something else. So why did you, why did you keep going? Something clicked in me that said, it's not right that I'm afraid to sit in a silent room mm. and not do anything. Mm. That doesn't seem right. That mm. doesn't seem healthy. That seems like a weakness. Mm. So it was a good... Uh, 10 plus years of spiritual practice of traveling the world, seeking different healing practices, going to Peru, working with ayahuasca, uh, going to South, Southeast Asia, exploring, you know, that area and the practices there, um, practicing yoga, qigong, um, various different types of meditation. Mm. And it was a few years ago that I met Satyan and then, it's just been kind of rolling from there. I've been very dedicated in the work that um, that he teaches and in the Warrior Sage mm. work. What resonated? Initially, what resonated was Satyan's strength mm. and openness at the same time. He had such an incredible strength and an openness, mm. a very good balance of that, mm. um, and very spiritually adept. Mm. And so as I started practicing these methods with him, I was like, man, these are really like well-structured, straightforward, get you deep, fast, provide so much benefit and transformation in your life uh, in a very short amount of time. Mm. So I found that after all the practices I've done, this, these practices are so... Um, beneficial and deep and simple and they're a way that I can I can support people I could support another in going to a deep place within themselves and healing something and clearing something in more of a concise easeful way than I have with anything else I've learned mm. and that's I think that's what spoke to me the most because I'm always driven to support other people in overcoming their pains and their struggles and the things that are keeping them from living a really healthy, really vibrant life. Mm. And these methods are something that I can support someone else in going through easier than anything. Mm. And you don't have to have a spiritual disposition to go to a deep place within yourself. Mm. Yeah. I really appreciate how you basically recapture the reason why I'm so attracted to his work as well. <clears throat> it's the efficacy it's the uh, efficiency and it's the ability to take people from point A to point B. Because it's one thing to share like, hey, meditate, but it takes freaking 10, 20, 30, maybe you'll get there. Maybe. Vipassana, amazing. Landmark Forum, amazing. But three days away from your family or 12 days, depends on which method you choose. Ayahuasca, not everyone's ready for ayahuasca. Again, it's all probabilistic, but his methods are more predictable and duplicatable. And as a scientist, by training, I'm attracted to repeatability. Right. Right. And, and simplicity. 
And I guess to say it in a more concise way, I think of everything, every spiritual practice, every healing practice, I just think of it as a form of meditation. Mm. So an ayahuasca ceremony, it's a form of meditation. Mm. Qigong, yoga, mm. sitting, any sitting meditation practice, chanting, they're all forms of meditation. Sound healing, which is something I also have been really focused in. It's all forms of meditation. These accelerated evolution methods are the best form of meditation that I have come across. Mm. We don't call it meditation necessarily, mm. but it's what it is mm. in my mind. Mm. Mm. Um, so that's why, that's what's really kept me coming back to it. Mm. And the way that there is the focus of being strong in every aspect of our lives. Mm. Mm. Your fitness, your finances, your family, and your fun. And your faith. And your faith. Mm. And that faith is, can be a faith in a bigger, something greater than yourself. Mm. It can be faith in God. It can be spiritual faith in it. And it's also about a faith in your own ability to do what you need to do, what you want to do, and live the life that you want to live. Mm. Yeah, faith that, about yourself. Believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. Big one. Yeah. Huge one. And it's an ongoing process too. <clears throat> yeah. Especially for people who are going through the ups and downs of the roller coaster of life, as I am right now, right? So having that faith, having the access to these tools are just tremendous. So I'm very, very thankful for being here, being with you over the past week. So I do actually have a, a, a side question that I'm quite yeah. curious about. Yeah. As you develop yourself, you're a martial artist, you're a professional fighter rather, and you've been practicing this meditation as you call it. And part of the, when I speak to people who are fighters, war fighters, they always think back on their spiritual practice of meditation and say, oh yeah, I, I will be a much better fighter now, now that I've had the skill of being aware of the awareness than before having the skill of being aware of the awareness, right? So I'm curious, as you progress in your outer game, your fighting skills, the mechanics of fighting, and as you progress in developing the inner awareness, which is allowing it to come and go like waves of the ocean. What is happening internally when you're being punched in the face? Or being um, aggressed when someone is on top of you, 250 sure. pounds. Right? So, as you're, so I'm curious to know that internal grappling. The inter so say I've got... And I had this recently. I've got, um, we've got this other black belt. It was really good, this third degree black belt at our gym. He's probably, you know, I'm about 180 pounds. He's probably 220, 225. You strong dude. Pounds on you. Yeah, yeah, strong dude. And he was on top of me a couple weeks ago, just drilling me, just like giving me such a hard time, driving his knee into my stomach, like all this stuff, like really holding me down hard. <laughs> And in those kinds of situations, I'm very aware of what's going on inside my mind, inside my body, right. while also having to be aware of everything that's going on physically and being very precise right. in what I'm doing because I could be in trouble really fast if I make the wrong move. Right. So because of years of training, I'm able to keep a clear state of mind and I'm able to be aware instead of just overwhelmed and losing clarity in that moment and just kind of um, being blind in that moment, the training allows me to, um, to see clearly mm -hmm. in those moments. So do you mind unpacking that? What's the difference between that, being fully aware, equanimous, let's use a you know, spiritual term, than say numbing? Because one may say, like, I'm just trying to numb all this pain and emotions out such that I can be, quote unquote, clear. What is the distinction between the two when you're in that state? If you don't have the training over time, it's not a choice to be numb. Ah. 
you just don't have the ability to, you're just in overwhelm. Got it. <clears throat> you're just stuck in overwhelm. So you don't have the ability, you don't have the skill to make clear decisions in that moment. Mm. When you're in the struggle, when you're overwhelmed, when you're stuck, when you're literally in a situation where you can't get out mm. in that moment because another person is putting force on you, mm. right? You can't get out until just the right moment when you find the space, when you find the right mm. movement. Mm. So it's knowing when to be calm and when to explode mm. when the space is there, when, when to be patient and when to go. Mm. And um, that's only cultivated through practice. That's only cultivated through experience. Mm. And if you don't have that training or that experience, you either, you may have the ability to be calm, but if you don't have the experience to know how to be calm and then move at the right time, you're going to be stuck underneath in pain, mm. struggling, and then you're going to get choked or you're going to get stuck in an arm lock or something. And mm. um, if we translate that to, to how life looks, if you don't take the time to develop mental, emotional skills and self-awareness, you're going to get stuck mm. in pinned down positions in life, struggling, heavy, overwhelming positions in life, mm. or maybe uh, a certain overwhelming moment mm. where something hits you all of a sudden in life and you don't know what to do. And then you ha probably have no idea why you're reacting. In you're just way. reacting. You're blinded. You're blindsided. You're just reacting mm -hmm. without any skill or presence. Mm. Your reactions take over. Mm. And so if we develop these skills in time over life, we can get hit with a sudden, someone close to us dies suddenly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change that it sucks and it hurts and it's overwhelming, but what changes is our presence mm. in that moment to process it in somewhat of a healthy way. Mm. To be conscious of how we're now treating other people as we grieve. Mm. Or if we got physically attacked mm. by someone in life. You know, someone who's been training for years, they'll be able to see clearly and react mm. in a much better way than someone who has no training. Mm overwhelmed by their adrenaline and by their adrenaline you just go blind and you start throwing limbs you start <laughs> flailing you start trying to protect yourself but you're doing a whole lot of effort with very little results mm. so that's kind of one way you could boil down any practice if it's a spiritual practice a consciousness practice a healing practice or a physical practice mm. we learn how to create much more efficient results Mm. Maximum efficiency with minimal effort. Mm. You're speaking my language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. that's, what I, that's where I see the translation where we need the internal and the external. Mm. Right? And so in jiu-jitsu, I'm always focused when I'm getting that pressure, when I'm in a tough spot with some other large, strong, skilled person on top of me and they're smothering me and smashing me and it's hard to breathe. And it's like, I know that I can't freak out because of through experience, I've found that makes it worse. Mm. So I have to conserve my energy. I have to protect myself, time things correctly, and then move right when there's just that little bit of space mm. to go. So I have a question. Because <clears throat> on the way, actually, on the way coming to the training today, I was thinking, in sports, as a, as a competitor, I'm just thinking, how do I win the game? How do I destroy the person physically but then i i was thinking about it some more because mental physical emotional and spiritual they're all connected so maybe am i trying to destroy the person physically mentally spiritually emotionally all at the same time like so i'm curious and that's the inquiry it's i don't have an answer it's just an inquiry so from your point of view as a professional fighter <clears throat> what's your aim just focus on the physical or just all areas, you trash talk, you do all these other, you know, different tactics to bleed into other aspects. <laughs> Complete destruction of the human yeah. being in front of you. Like, what do you think about? A funny thing that I like to, a funny thing, but a true thing <clears throat> that I like to say to other people is my, off the mat, my aim is to be the kindest person you ever met. Mm -hmm. On the mat, my aim is to wreck you. Mm -hmm. Destroy you. 
Yeah. Photo destruction. <laughs> so that's what, that's the thing that I like to say. Yeah. But let's say when I'm going to compete against another person. Yeah. I'm not thinking about their destruction. Mm. I'm thinking about my peak performance. Mm. Your skill level. I'm thinking about me, not about them. Gotcha. So it doesn't matter who's in front of me. My focus is 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 um, performing to the best of my ability. Mm. And if I perform to the best of my ability, win or lose, I walk away feeling good about myself. I see. And then along with that, I am thinking with my with my technique, with my fighting, with the pressure that I'm putting on them, I am trying to break their will, mm -hmm. which essentially means I'm not directly trying to get into your head, mm -hmm. but I am trying to use my the best of my performance mm -hmm. to put you in positions that's slowly breaking your will, mm -hmm. breaking you believing in your technique over mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if I get into your head and I'm smashing you, mm -hmm. it's not that I'm directly trying to get into your head, but inadvertently I am. Mm -hmm. Right, with my effectiveness mm -hmm. to make you feel like, shit, I don't have this anymore. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't consciously think it, you're feeling it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm getting the edge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I only asked that question. <clears throat> I only asked that question because I'm also recalling the greats, right? The Michael Jordans, the whoever, the, um, Bruce the Lee. McGregor. The, yeah, the they all trash talk. And, and their intention is not about sportsmanship. The intention right. is just, or Schwarzenegger, before he competes, like, hey, are you, have you lost pounds? And then he's, as a way to get into your head and for you to start to plant the sea of self-doubt. It's a real thing. Yeah, yeah. for sure. It's, it's a tactic. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> and when you're competing at the elite level, a little bit of self-doubt makes the difference. It's a game of inches. Yeah, yeah. For sure internally and externally for sure i also asked the question of the ability to maintain equanimity because i'm an amateur i'm in the beginning stages of my boxing for you know three six months more dedicated and man i can have all the theoretical uh you know literature around being calm on the fire and everything, but when you're being punched in the stomach, like that first punch, and then you're getting hit in the head, then right away that survival mode of fight, flight, or freeze or flee, uh, you know, all of it. <laughs> Boxing's tough, man. When you go against guys that have been training for a while, they're training two weapons. They're honing two these two weapons, and they hit so hard. You get used to it's like getting hit with a stone every time. Yeah, and um, I had 130 pound, you know, guys I'd I'd spar with, and they could drop me with a body punch. Yeah, you know, yeah. just because they've been doing it. And so one thing we'll say to people in jujitsu when they're someone's a little newer, and they're like, I keep I keep doing what you tell me to do. I feel like I'm doing the technique right, but I'm going against him, and it's not working. I'm like, well, how long has he been training? Right. How long have you been training? Right. Right. So we say mat time. Yeah. Yeah. So we can have all the ideas, same thing Satin was saying, how do you get better at a horse stance? You do the horse stance. So you can have all the things you're thinking and trying to do are probably correct. Mm -hmm. It's just now it's just putting in the time Yeah. that makes the difference. Yeah. And we can translate that to every area of life. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> One of my uh, ayahuasca epiphany was you know how everyone says 10,000 hours so if you look at let's say a professional fighter in your case yeah, math time right I'm at you know hour I don't know 100 150 whatever you're uh, logging at a thousand two thousand five thousand hours probably more I'm just making stuff up yeah I have and then right away there's no it's an obvious comparison there so yeah so, so it's kind of um, disempowering to try to compare like, hey, why am I performing so uh, poorly against Andrew? Well, of course, he's being, 
<laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's just the time. Yeah, it's the time. Yeah, it's just that, those years of refinement yeah. and experience. Yeah. You know, it's like we could be both doing the same technique and we both know how to do it correctly. But um, say if I've been training longer, I have an awareness of everything else that's happening around that technique. Mm hmm. All the, the nuances, all the, the different nuances, applications, yeah. every little different scenario that can happen on the way yeah. in doing that technique. Yeah. And then, you know, doing it for years, I'm just inevitably, you're doing it right and I'm doing it more right. Yeah. yeah. It's like the degree of rightness. Yeah. 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 So as a serious practitioner of transformational artistry, from your point of view, what are some of the key areas of skills, key skills one needs to master for their own self-mastery as well as a way to uh, empower others to awaken, to live their best life? Just you know, rattle off a few key skills from your point of view. I guess, are you able to clarify that Sure. any further? Okay, maybe ask in a different way. Yeah. <clears throat> As a noble warrior, what are some of the key skills from your point of view one must master knowing what you know now? Well, I think it's the ability to be really present in your life and be real about where you are, where you are in your life. Um, in terms of your career, your relationships, what you want to be doing, um, the goodness, the, the things that you're grateful for each day, just being really present, being really present with the people that are important to you in your lives and present to those relationships. I think if you want to feel happiness, if you want to feel any health, I mean, that is a key that's the key requirement. You know, that's the point of it. Mm. And of course, um, to speak very generally, the ability to meditate mm. helps that tremendously. So meditation is a, it's a, it's a tactical skill one can learn and yeah. master and practice. Which is a very general thing. There's many, as we were mentioning before, there's many different forms of that. But the ability to meditate and have that kind of focus and that kind of presence Mm -hmm. is necessary, is what, a key. What other skills are there other than meditation, a general form of meditation? Uh, key skills. So, it's a good question. I'm trying to speak like, uh, trying to think broadly. Hmm. You mentioned also kindness as well, right? Is there any way that one could practice being kind? Yeah, I think that's a part of um, part of presence. Mm. Um, you know, I think kindness is cultivated through practice and being conscious through life experiences. Um, yeah, key skill, I guess not a lot of like really clear answers are coming up as far as like really general key skills. Well, you had mentioned um, fitness, finance, faith and fun and what was the other one? Relationship, family? Are there family, any yeah. sk specific skills that... Okay, so... You know, yeah, I mean, key skills, if I look at in my life, the most important skills um, that I focus on are having good relational skills, good communication, um, and being able to be present with people in a good way, being able to be open with people in a good way in my life, um, having good skills around business and finances, knowing, understanding finance understanding business and all the logistical steps and everything that goes into running a business 
You know, if you have something you're very passionate about, usually people that are really passionate don't often like to be in a nine to five that's just paying the bills, right? You want to be growing your own business a lot of the time. Not necessary, but a lot of people are that way. And so learning how to have good business skills and good finance skills is really important in the world, mm. right? And then uh, meditation and um, and being able to relax. Mm. Speak more about that. How do you practice being better at being uh, relaxed? I'm pretty bad at that. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. So. I fidget. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Just really giving yourself permission to like, fuck, I worked my ass off for 12 hours today. I can just like, whatever I need to get done, it can wait till tomorrow. It's 8 p.m. I'm just going to chill the rest of the night with my family or with a friend or have a beer and watch something, you know, watch my favorite Netflix thing or something. Just like let yourself fully relax. Yeah. You know, or take a vacation. Yeah. You know, we talk about extreme laziness. That's right. Here. Work extreme. You can work really hard, but then give yourself permission to have extreme laziness. Mm. And if you fit in those times, you can kind of call it like a, a time of yin energy. You know, mm. our world really glorifies yang energy, mm. active energy, always being active, always thinking about something, always doing. But if we don't incorporate that time for that yin relaxation, um, your mind's quiet. You're not thinking about, you know, your mind's not rattling on about the list of everything that you need to do. Mm. You need that time in order to be successful in any kind of uh, um, sustainable way mm. over the years. Mm. And I've heard many of very, very successful coaches and business people, they talk about some of their greatest inspirations come from when they're chilling on the beach somewhere mm -hmm. or when they're just, they've let themselves relax for a few days and then all of a sudden that something pops for them. Some creative pop comes out of that mm -hmm. rest and relaxation. So let's actually talk about that a little bit. As a serious competitor, <clears throat> professional fighter, transformational artist, how do you amp up the intensity for relaxation? How do you amp up the intensity for when you're practicing transformational artistry or jiu-jitsu? How do you really like dedicate that concentrated time and effort into that? And do you even think about that? Or do you yeah, not? I think about it. It's one of the hardest parts of my training mm. and one of the most important. So I, it helps me to think of sleep and relaxation as part of my training. Mm -hmm. um, and like for me personally, I've made it now. So like Sundays, I don't, Sunday is the one day a week where I don't schedule anything. Mm -hmm. So that's a non-negotiable. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Sundays, I'm usually good about that. Okay, good. <laughs> all right, good. So, so yeah, all right. But, um, yeah, so like carving out one day a week where you know, like I don't schedule anything on this day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the way it is, to, like if I'm working hard and training hard and, and doing everything to the fullest, <clears throat> then when it's time for me to relax, I can really embrace that relaxation knowing that I gave my all to my doing, mm -hmm. to my passion, mm -hmm. to my art form, to my improvement. If I'm always giving my all to my improvement, it's easy to relax when it's time because mm. I'm at peace with myself. Mm. If I'm not at peace with myself, it's very difficult to relax. Mm. If I feel that it's always unfinished business, it's very difficult to relax. Mm. So I think in order to enjoy relaxation, we got to be on top of our shit, mm. which I'm not pretending to be perfect at, mm. but I'm always doing my best at it. Mm. So a lot of people who are listening to this are probably overachievers like me, because like attracts likes, right? Yeah. So do you feel like, and, and, and one may feel guilty when they're relaxing totally. or resting. Yeah. 
do you feel like that may be the perfect time to uh, neutralize or equanimize those charges, those polarities? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Good. Yeah. So to anyone listening, it's like you have guilt around relaxation or you, you feel not, not worthy of the relaxation, mm -hmm. right? without expounding how to do a whole accelerated evolution process, just feel that fully. Let yourself sit with that fully. Think, okay, it's time to relax. I feel guilty for even sitting down and relaxing for X amount of reasons, right? Sit down and feel that guilt completely. Do the opposite of what you're probably doing is trying not to feel it. Uh, okay, shut up, guilt. I'm going to push you aside right now so I can sit and relax and enjoy myself. We're having a good time right? Sit down and take a few minutes to actually feel that guilt as fully as you can and then magnify it. Notice where you're feeling it in your body and then watch what happens there, right? You may find that letting yourself feel it fully, you may find that allowing yourself to feel it fully, being with it, some clarity might come of where that's really coming from. You may uh, let that guilt fully express itself so it's had its peace and now you can move on instead of just chatter in the background, you're not listening to it. You may have a new insight on why you actually feel that guilt and realize, okay, you know what? I don't actually need to hang on to that. Thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. For the guys who are listening to this, <clears throat> this is a very, very powerful process, even though it sounds super simple, but it's simple and extremely effective. So I really invite you to try that on. For the, there's, we have the principle that persistence causes, or resistance causes persistence. Mm -hmm. Right? So in the, the principle of duplication that we follow, which just simply means feeling something fully. Mm -hmm. When we allow these things to be fully expressed, mm -hmm. their, their intention is accomplished mm -hmm. and they can move on. If we mm -hmm. think of that guilt, even give that guilt, that guilt as like an entity or a person, mm -hmm. you know, we let that guilt fully be um, satisfied mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. in a healthy way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it's not persisting. Agree. One uh, metaphor that I share with others is imagine whatever emotions comes out of you as a um, plastic ball or a balloon. You're trying to push that balloon into the ocean by trying to suppress it, trying to ignore it, trying to bury it deeper and deeper. And then that is only going to have a greater reaction. So the moment that you lose your attention on that particular issue, guess what? It's going to just come out and then burst out of the surface of the ocean yeah. and just going to surprise you. And then imagine, so I came from a, a, a Chinese background and I, what I thought was stoicism was suppression of all these emotions. So it was, I have tons of different negative emotions in the, in, in the uh, underneath all the, surface of the ocean you have to like spend so much energy trying to suppress all of them and then when yeah. it comes out I'm, I'm surprised for some reason right <laughs> rather than as you said feeling this emotion fully and and it, it to integrate these polarities in me yeah. such that I'm equanimized and then and does allow me to operate from my most optimal state of being and then I'd say, okay, another key skill, compassion. Okay, so this guilt comes up. We allow ourselves to be fully present with that guilt. And then we have compassion for ourselves. Know that this guilt is just a visitor. This guilt is not you. So another helpful way of looking at the things that go on within ourselves is we can think of them as visitors. We have all kinds of visitor, visitors that come and go all, all, all day, all the time. Mm -hmm. The feeling of happiness, that's even a visitor. It's not mine. It's not my happiness. It's just happiness that is coming up mm -hmm. in my mind, in my body, in my emotions. Mm -hmm. And it's going to leave again. Mm -hmm. It's going to come. Please don't leave. 
it's going to come. Please stay with me forever and It's going to come. Yeah. It's going to go. I'm right. going to feel more happy than at times. I may, I may be someone where I can, I mean, I can genuinely say I'm underlyingly, I'm a happy person. Mm-hmm. Like I can genuinely say that. Mm-hmm. But the feeling of exuberant happiness and not, you know, it comes and goes in lesser degrees. So mm-hmm. guilt, it's just a visitor. Don't identify with it. It's just you. Mm-hmm. Time to relax. Okay, there's guilt again. Oh yeah, I see you. I've seen you before. You come over all the time. Mm. I don't need. I don't need you to be here all the time. Mm. Like, I see you. Thank you. I know there's more work to do, but I'm just gonna relax now. Mm. It's just a visitor. Got it. I appreciate this. Thanks, my friend. So we have a few minutes left. <clears throat> what are some resources that you can direct people to if they want to cultivate some of these skills of compassion? physicality, mm. intensity, aggression, perhaps. Yeah. What are some of the key skills uh, and meditation? What are some of the resources or books or seminars or courses that you can send them to for them to really cultivate that? Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm biased to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm. I love Jiu-Jitsu. There's gyms and schools everywhere. If uh, you're feeling called to a new physical practice, just Google, you know, you live in LA, you live in Seattle, you live in Oklahoma, whatever town, city you live in, Google jiu-jitsu in your town, city, go check out a class. That could be a great practice for you. How do you know you meet a right teacher though? Let's just talk about that for a moment. Yeah. So, uh, I guess if you don't have anyone in your life that knows jiu-jitsu, the best you can do is go in and see how it feels. You know, most places will give you a free trial. You go in and you, you see how it feels to you. Okay. If you have someone in your life that you know that's been training in jiu-jitsu for a while, then you go pick their brain about how would you know that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, oh, ideally, you want to go somewhere where they've got a black belt who's been teaching for a while. Mm-hmm. Some places don't have a black belt. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Great. Yeah. Um, and obviously, usually there's online reviews as well. And mm. You know, get go there, connect with students, see if if there's a if there's a student base, like a, a strong student base of people that have been there for a lot of years, then mm. you know it's probably a good place. Mm. If you got people, a lot of people that have just clearly been coming and going, not there for very long, well, mm. that'll tell you something, mm-hmm. right? Mm. You want to go in and feel a, a school or a gym that has a tight knit community mm. feel. Mm-hmm. They've known each other for a long time. They've stuck mm. around for mm. a reason. Mm. Um, David Data Mm -hmm. is an amazing resource. Mm -hmm. So he's got amazing books, um, Intimate Communion, Way of the Superior Man for the men out there. Way of the Superior Man is also an amazing book for women, in my opinion, because it, it can, for women that have not had a good masculine presence in their life and they don't have a good example of what a good, strong man and masculine presence can be, Way of the Superior Man could could show a woman what a man can really be like and look like, and they can look for that in men and know mm. and see good signs in men, the kind of men they want to attract. Mm. And they can teach men how to be the kind of men that they really want to be. Mm. Um, so that's Way of the Superior Man. Intimate Communion is amazing. Blue Truth is amazing. Um, so those are all great books by David Data. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously checking out, uh, Warrior Sage or Accelerated Evolution Academy. Anyone can come in and just learn those processes and see them, uh, for themselves. Um, my business is Embody the Practice. So it's all about how do we bring the benefits from our practices into our daily lives? And that's mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. Mm. Um, so I have embodythepractice.com. And um, anyone can contact me through email or you, my phone number's right on there. So you can just give me a call. Mm. We can jam on, you tell me what's going on in your life. Mm. We can jam on that mm. and see if I can support you in that. And if I'm not the right person to support you in something, I'm going to di- direct you right to the next person who I know. Mm. You know, I know a vast amount of just people who work with people one-on-one that are mm. amazing practitioners. Beautiful. Yeah. Andrew, thank you so much for sharing your presence, your way of being, your practices. 
Um, for those of you who are listening, I hope you really feel the transmission that Andrew has shared with us so generously. The, the gentleness, the, the, the kindness, the masculine way of being, <clears throat> super grounded. So I really, really appreciate being here on the show. I appreciate you having me, CK, and um, I could go on and on for hours. So thanks for having me on, letting me jam with you, and I hope that this um, you know, facilitates a good impact for any of you that are listening. And um, you know, I just want to say from my heart, from, from my heart and from the hearts of everyone that we work with in our community, you know, if you're out there and you're struggling uh, with anything, we really are here to support you in the best way possible. We want everyone to, to know what it means to be at home in yourself, mm. to have healthy relationships, to live a healthy, mm. um, empowered life. So that's our passion. And we're just, we're really here for you mm. for real. Oh, 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 Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. So thank you, CK.